Um, well, first of all, I just want to thank the band because uh, that was awesome. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a special treat, and uh, the conferences, the retreats they're going to be playing at are pretty, pretty blessed, uh, just getting a, a small taste of it there. Uh, but I have to say, U Life is pretty blessed too, because that's, that's the U Life band plus Aaron. So, um, so we, uh, we have a pretty good deal on Tuesday nights, and I'm glad we can come down here so they can work out the, the kinks on the inner ears and stuff like that. Uh, fun little setting, a little bit different, a little bit bigger, of course. Uh, but tonight, we're going to continue uh, what we've been starting. Mackenzie, my dear wife, got us kicked off last week uh, while Aaron and I were actually uh, bunking together in Orlando in a little monastery. Uh, we were actually... Uh, doing seminary classes together, so we were having fun all week in 70 and sunny. So, I don't know about you guys, but, um, but anyways, they got us, uh, Kenzie got us going, and she's, uh, she kind of got us started on step one. So, just overview, we're going to do this series, four weeks, this is week two, and we're going to kind of give you just a very practical approach to reading the Bible. And, uh, you know, I think the tricky part about us as Christians is that we want to know God, and we want to figure out what that means. We want to figure out what it means to grow in our faith. Uh, but we have a bit of a—I'm uh, uh, trying to catch the word here—a uh, tendency to, to drift away from what the Word says, what the Bible says. And for all practical purposes, that is our source. That is our source for knowing who God was. And I was just thinking about during that song, the last song they were singing, th that main chorus line, I want to know you more. I want to know you more. I want to know you more. And I really do believe that's the heart of each one of you. That's why you're here. And at the end of the day, we all want that, but we have a hard time figuring out how to, how to do that, how to find that. And uh, in John 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. So really, if we want to know God more, if we want to know Him, and God, the Word is God, we have to know His Word inside and out. In Genesis 1, it talks about how God literally created the world into existence with his words. He just spoke. That's the kind of power that's in his Bible. That's the kind of power that's available to us every day, every moment that we open it in our Bible or open up our Bible app. That's the kind of power we have. And so that's what this series is all about, is to encourage you to engage that power, to engage God in that way, and to figure out what it really means to know God more. And uh, so Mackenzie started last week, kind of in the step one. Step one is familiarization, i.e. read, right? You got to get to know the passage well. That's why she had you do the five and five. How many of you guys did it? I'm putting you on the spot. Don't lie. You're in a church. All right, good job. So the reason we're having you read it multiple times is because it just takes repeated reading to really absorb it. I mentioned Aaron and I are in several classes together. Like one of our classes right now, uh, it wasn't even about Ephesians. It just was related to Ephesians. Part of the assignment was read Ephesians four times through the course of the class. Read it all the way through four times. There's a reason for this. They want you to become incredibly familiar with the passage. That's step one. She talked about kind of the major reason that we should be in the Bible, and I just mentioned that. We want to know God. I was just thinking in the No Longer Slave song, and the, the chant in that is, I'm a son or daughter of God. This is our identity as a Christian. And I just think about what would it, some of you guys actually have to deal with this. I know it's a real thing what it's like to not know your father or to maybe have a father but be very, very disjointed and you can't really get to know him well. That is an incredibly, incredibly difficult thing to swallow. And I don't take it lightly. I, we have that direct impact in our family. And so I just was thinking of that song, what does it mean to be a son or a daughter of the father but for us not to know him, to engage him? Would we choose to not engage our father? No. Can we get to know our father through other people? Sure. I could tell, I could go to my dad's uh, employees and ask them all about my dad, and they could tell me about him. Sure. But I have the opportunity to go to my dad directly 
and get to know him on a whole nother deep, intimate level. And that's the opportunity we have in God's word. So that is our reason. Mackenzie talked about the major challenges. Time, right? This is real. Time. And it's not getting, it's not slowing down any, 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 any more. If you're in school, I remember when I used to say, when I graduate and have more time. Ha! Ha! Never happens. Never happens. Especially if you get married and knock up your wife really quick. Never happens. Hey. Um, but this is, this is the reality. We don't get more time. Translation. Sometimes the Bible seems oh, so unapproachable because we don't understand what it is, how it was all compiled. Why is this God's word? How come when I take this New Testament class and they talk about some jankety gospel of Thomas, that's not in there? Why? You, you struggle with these questions. Or, you know, my uncle says KJV is the way and you're the devil if you don't read it. So you're just like, oh, I just won't read any because I don't want to get cursed. You know, these are the kind of things, and I'm, I don't take it lightly, like these are the kind of things that we deal with so we just don't run up against them. We're just like, eh, I'll just stay back here in the safe zone. And then the other thing she talked about was training. That's what keeps us from it. That's what this series is all about. Hoping to give you guys a little bit of training to help you engage the Bible, engage God confidently. So uh, that's what we're going to do. We're going to go through step one is, like I said, familiarization. Step two, hermeneutics. How do you like that word? That's the kind of word you get to learn when you go to seminary. That's the kind of words that, you know, separates me and you. You know why? Because we're exactly the same, but I say hermeneutics. But we're going to kind of part one, part two in uh, the next two weeks. And then the final week is contextualization or application. What does it all mean to us? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to go down this path. This is not going to be like a deep emotional series. This is going to be a how-to, a little bit different than what we're used to. And then in the next four weeks after that, we're actually going to pick a book in the Bible and do it together. And I'm going to tell you a reason for that. Here's, uh, it's a good problem to have. Let me premise this. But one of the problems we have in a, in a, in a culture, in a country where uh, media is so readily available and internet at blazing speeds and churches that do a really good job of getting their information out, the problem we have is we have amazing pastors at our fingertips. Literally, in five minutes, you could search one of the best sermons ever given and get it. There's a problem with this, though, because, and I'm not going to go into all the problems. There's one problem with this that I'm going to mention, is that you're getting this amazing preaching, but all they really do is step four. That's all you ever see. They do step one, step two, and step three on their own time in their studies, and they come out and have this amazing, profound connection. They're like, how did he get that? out of the book of Nehemiah. I don't even know how to say Nehemiah. And all of a sudden, you're just baffled, impressed, and like, that Judah Smith, I'm going to listen to him again. But the problem is, all you're getting is step four. So you hear this great message, and you hear this pastor come out with this profound idea related, pulled right out of the, pa- right out of the scripture, and apply it directly into your life in a profound way. And you're just like, dang, that's sweet. But what you don't get is how he got there. So in a large way, it hamstrings a big generation. The people are getting step four. And this is why this is important to me. I want to get you guys step one, two, and three. And so the next series for four weeks, we're going to awkwardly go through step one, two, and three. Because here at Life, this college-age ministry, we major in awkward. So we're going to do that. And... Uh, we're going to give you, it's not going to be like completely dry and boring, but we're just going to give you a sneak peek into step one and two, one, two, and three, and then get you to step four so you feel like, you feel as if you have the confidence to do that on your own. That's the goal. All right. So uh, that's kind of the problem that we're, we're facing. That's a problem we're going to tackle. But I want to kind of open this up a little bit, getting you imagining a little bit. And how many guys love a certain TV show series? Don't miss it. You've watched every one. I heard Tyler watch nine seasons of The Office over Christmas break. Nice job. Um, how many times have you went to a friend 
and said, you have to watch, let's just say the office now, the office. And they're like, you know, they're like, okay, okay. And you're, you're getting all hyped up about it. You're like, oh, this is so funny in this bar and this bar. And that, you know, that Michael, he's, a, he's, a, he's hilarious, right? And that person says, well, I watched it once. I didn't, I didn't really get it. And you say, well, did you start from the beginning? That's the first thing we say. Did you start from the beginning? And you're, they're like, no. Like, oh, start from the beginning. Then it'll be hilarious. You'll love it. That's what we do. But for some reason, we go pick up the Bible and go, boop, right there. And just read it, three verses, like, bam, life verses. I don't get it. It's incredibly interesting and compelling. I have no idea what it means, but it sounds awesome. That's, that really is the equivalent. Or you do that, and you hit three verses, and you're like, that is crazy. Is Isaiah smoking something? <laughs> and you never open it up again, because that's just too much. And I have to say, did you read it from the beginning? Not like Genesis beginning, although that's not a bad idea. I'm just saying maybe the beginning of the chapter. Beginning of the book. So that's one scenario. Here's the other scenario, is you, you have a movie you absolutely love. Tell me some movies you absolutely love. Got two. All right. This is good. All right. Mine, because I have an extreme man crush uh, on Anthony Hopkins. I know it sounds weird, but it's real. Um, you know, Silence of the Lambs, Hannibal Lecter. Uh, I like that guy. He's in a lot of good movies. So uh, one of my favorite movies is Legends of the Fall. Have you guys seen that movie? Bear Attacks. This is way before Revenant, you know, way before it. So uh, there's this whole thing, and usually girls aren't interested until the opening scene when Brad Pitt runs in on a horse with his shirt off. Then girls get really interested in the movie. Uh, but I love that movie. I've seen it a ton of times. And there's just this kind of wild character, Tristan, who's just, uh, he lives a different way. You know, it's, it's, in the, it's in the Old West when everything's starting to modernize and civilize a bit. And he just doesn't want to go that route. He's a wild man. He lives kind of in the woods, off the grid. And you see this tension as he grows and all these people are becoming more civilized, including his brothers. And in the end, what happens is he never really acclimates to that. And in the end, it ends up, some things happen. I don't want to be a spoiler because it's a great movie. But he ends up residing the rest of his days until he dies in the woods. And you take this great compelling meaning out of this, or at least I do, of this idea of this deep internal desire to live off the grid, but the social structures the man kind of push and press on you and can only cause you to get pushed out or adopt can't beat them, join them, right? And I take this big, profound thought out, and if I were to ask maybe a female, what did you get out of it? Love story. And I'd say, what was your big takeaway from this? I'd be like, well, don't date a high-risk guy, <laughs> right? Because it's just going to break your heart. Go with the safe, civilized man, my point is this, is I can watch that movie, get this deep meaning out of it, and that's the meaning I take out of it. And that's the meaning I stick with. And I'll, even when I watch it again, that's the meaning in my mind, and I never get a new meaning out of it. This is how we engage the Bible often, is we'll read it one time, have this profound moment, that is the meaning we gather. We could read it again, but we never read it with fresh eyes, so it's one singular meaning. That's all we take away from it. But we'll never address it again unless probably somebody says, well, I got this out of it. And if it's compelling enough, we might just adopt that view. But here's the problem with that, is then you become dependent on other people for your growth, for your faith. And we're talking about, not that that's a bad thing, but you don't want to be dependent. We're talking about how do we as individuals grow in our faith. So we're going to kind of address these two issues and how to, how to dig a little deeper in our faith. The main thing is we have to continue to dig more into the Bible, and the way we can do that is by 
learning the context. We have to learn the context. So what does that mean? You guys understand what context means. And last week, Kenzie started peeling the layers off context a little bit. She mentioned three ways that you can start getting a little bit of the context. Does anybody care to guess? Or no? Genre? Good. Who wrote it? Not when. To who they wrote it. Those are the three she mentioned. Those are like... uh, those are like context 101 right there. Who said it? Who did they say it to? And what kind of a book am I reading? And it's pretty simple. We naturally, we naturally, because we're a reading culture, we automatically ask that question, who's reading it? Or who's, who's saying it? Who's writing it? Who are they saying it to? The trickier one that we don't always mess with is genre, if, unless you're an English major, of course, then you do. Uh, but that one's a, a big deal. And so I want to kind of touch on that a little bit, a little bit closer. Uh, but I just want to give you some genres that this isn't me saying it. This is, this is biblical scholars saying that, that we can find in the Bible. One of them is law. And this is kind of that Old Testament, Ten Commandments, ceremonial law, that kind of stuff. This is all the things that God says, go do or don't do. When you're reading that, it's pretty cut and dry. Don't do it or do it. It's law. And you read it with that kind of mind. Another one, another genre is history or narrative. This is literally telling a story about what happened. You have to approach that different. Because just because David was really excited and took off all his clothes in the street and started singing and dancing, praising Jesus, doesn't mean that's like a prescriptive thing that all Christians should take their clothes off in the streets and start worshiping, right? You have to understand this is a story embedded with meaning and you have to read it that way. Prophecy, those are tough ones. There's older prophecy, there's newer prophecy like Revelation. You have to sort out when it happened, what is it? But at the end of the day, prophecy is is this. It's God's chosen mouthpiece, typically warning people to turn back towards God and also to inform them about what's to come. We have to read it in that way. That tells us a little bit about not only who God is, but what's going to happen. Wisdom books. Now, this is really important. Like, Proverbs is a wisdom book. Proverbs, just like, you know, you see those little pithy things on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, and it says, you know, an Irish proverb or whatever. Are Proverbs, in that sense, indefinitely true? No, they're just generally true, right? In the Bible, it becomes weird because Proverbs, wisdom, is generally true, but it's in the Bible. So is it generally true or because it's the Bible, absolutely true? And you have to understand when it's, the Bible is 100% true. There's no denying that. But these are general truths made in the Bible. You know, there's there's the proverb, raise up a child in the way it should go and they'll never depart, right? How many of you guys know a pastor's kid who's departed? generally true. It's not like a promise. It's generally true, so we have to read it with that in mind. Poetry, the Psalms, these are even different because it's all creative language. They're not writing a literal thing that happened most of the time. It's all creative language, so you have to approach it creatively. It's imagery that's set up to communicate something. And in some cases, just like uh, we do in our culture, uh, let me, let me, I didn't have a good example before I came up here. Um, okay, so actually this example carries both ways. So in our, in our culture, we talk about, we make movies about dragons all the time, right? Do we believe dragons are true? Except for Josh, do we believe dragons are true? No, but we talk about them, we make movies about them. Actually, in the Old Testament, they talk about dragons. Does it make the, that, does it mean that because the Bible said there's absolute dragons? No. It just means they're speaking to a culture in a language they understand. They're making references, creative references to drive a bigger meaning. So again, we have to do that. Parables in the New Testament, these are stories typically told by Jesus. It's a story that didn't actually happen. It's a fictional story to drive one point, typically. One point. 
epistles, letters in the New Testament. These are from who to who. They were usually like, you see Paul write a lot of them. He's usually helping, encouraging other individuals or Christian groups of Christians. You have to read it with that in mind. So that's just kind of the peel back of context. This is very important. And we're going to fill in that puzzle a little bit more today and look at a few more kind of categories of context. And the first one kind of relates to what we were just talking about, and that's literary context. Literary context. So this literally means, so now you guys read a passage, right? Or you guys read it five times or twice or once, depending on how, uh, how, you know, solid you stayed. Uh, once you get that done, you feel really familiar, you should be drawn and compelled to all of a sudden say, well, why is this here? And read before it and read after it, the whole thing with the TV show. Did you read it from the beginning? And so that's part of the lot of literary context is let's put it in its proper place in this chapter, in this book. What does it mean? Why is it written this way? This stuff we've already talked about. I'm not going to spend too much time on this one. And then ultimately, where does it fall in the book? Where does it fall in the Bible? Why is it put in that place? What kind of uh, references do they do? You see in the Old Testament all the time, the Hebrew language, especially in the poets, They'll use parallelism all the time. They'll use, like, start verses by the letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So they'll go, you know, I'm not, I don't know Hebrew, so, but it'll go like A, B, C, D, the equivalent, and then backwards. They do this kind of stuff. Why? It's important. It's important. Uh, 1 Timothy 3.16 says this, 2 Timothy, all scripture is breathed out by God. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. This is our verse for the night. This is really significant because uh, one thing you have to understand, I was silly and didn't bring my Bible with me on a Bible day. Uh, You know, it's about yay thick, right? Unless you have really bad vision, then it might be this thick, or you have lots of study notes, and then it might be that big. But it's pretty thick, and there's a lot of words in there. But you think this thing has been written over the course of four to five thousand years and we get that much how many words were not included in the history of israel a lot a lot in god's divine inspiration and sovereignty he brought us to this canon this collection and so you have to imagine every word in there is very very important and even the things that are left out you have to wonder about why it's left out. But especially notice if it's in there, it's important. When you go through the Old Testament and you see like pages of lineage and you just like, and unto him and unto him, and you're like, flip, 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 flip. Here we go, back into the good stuff again. I get it, I do. But that is in there for a reason. That detail is in there for a reason. So we have to understand, this is, this is our drive. This is what should uh, move us in how we're reading. The next context that I want to mention is this immediate context. I'm calling it immediate. This isn't, this is my phrase. There's probably better phrases out there, but I didn't like some other ones that I thought of. And why I say immediate? Because it's, it includes a few things. Uh, it includes, obviously, culture, and related to that is language. What is the culture? What is the language of the people who are writing and the people immediately around them. So if we look at, you know, uh, the passion of the Christ that week, right? The week before Jesus' death. We have to look at what is the immediate context here. We have Jesus, a Jew. And we have to look at, well, Jesus spoke Aramaic. It's the common trade language, right? So that means he was around common people, presumably. He interacted with the Jews a ton, so he inevitably would have known Hebrew as well. He taught, so he connected with the priests and uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees as you read it. There's also, in the midst of this, is Roman culture. Rome runs, the, runs everything in this region at this time, so you have the Roman culture influencing this. You have Roman law. You have Roman uh, situations happening. Uh, You have those languages. You know, all this stuff you have to start considering. What does that mean? And then you have to look at where are they at geographically, not just immediately, you know, 
um, you know, they're in Jerusalem, but even uh, where are they at in Jerusalem? There's great maps and reference points and all that that you can get out there that gives you a clue on this stuff, because this is all significant. I don't know how many of you guys have read Acts, but it's really easy to read the book of Acts and be like, and Paul went here, and Paul went here, and Paul went here, and Paul went here, and you're like, that's a cool seven-day road trip. And you start looking at a map, you're like, and he was, what? How, he, was, he was on foot or, you know, on donkey? Or how is he getting there? Because this is a long way. A long way. And so it starts giving you perspective. Where exactly did he go and how did he get there? But these are the things we have to think about. Uh, historically, at that time, what's going on? This is a very useful tool. I mentioned, you know, this example in Rome. You know, there's certain clues in there. Uh, because we know it's a Roman crucifixion, Roman-led culture, we can actually go find existing information that the details aren't provided for in the Bible and learn more about the situation. For example, right before Jesus had to go carry his cross, right? It just has like one line that says, Jesus was flogged. And that sounds bad. It sounds pretty bad. But honestly, there's not a lot of imagery there. But if you actually start going and looking what a Roman flogging entails, and they have a whip with five leather strands on it and attached to it. They have bones and wood and metal all attached on it, and they whip them as hard as they can and rake it across his back. And they do it over and over and over as hard as they can until literally organs are starting to spill out. All of a sudden, we get a much clearer idea of the pain and why all of a sudden in the next verse, it talks about how Jesus would had to carry the cross because this was customary for Romans, and we can find that out again from Roman historical context, why it said they asked another guy, Simon of Cyrene, to come lift it. All of a sudden, it makes sense now. It's not just because they're picking on Simon. They might have been. It's because Jesus literally probably didn't have the capacity to hold it because he got beat so bad. We can learn this stuff just by starting to explore Roman history, Roman culture, that doesn't necessarily explicitly say in the Bible. This is the value of context, of finding that immediate context. The last context I want to talk about is this kind of big picture or macro context. We have these events that happen through history, and we see them through the Bible. And we look at, let's just stick with that example. We see that happening, and we obviously, that has a lot of meaning for us. But it's easy just to leave it in that week and the, the thing about it is, is this week was predicted in Genesis. And we can see that. We can see it's Genesis 3. This is predicted. All the way back then. There is a bigger context here. At what point do these events fit in the, the whole of redemptive historical history? And then it draws you to the question, why did this happen? Why did this have to happen? Why is this in the Bible? Remember, there's no detail unimportant. So why is it? It's no longer just this isolated thing that happens that interests history guys like me. It actually matters to our faith today. And you start backing up. And some of these useful tools that you can get is a biblical theology. And it gives you the whole overview and span. God is a God of covenants. He makes these, these promises, these covenants with his people. And he started right from the very beginning with Adam and Eve. And he makes these covenants, and he says, I will do this. And this is what you will do in return. And if you follow it, there will be these blessings. If you don't, there will be consequences. This is what God has done all the way through. And it's not, a, it's not about punishment. It's about God's holiness. And God has made these covenants all along, and we're a part of that covenant of grace. We're part of that new covenant that was started with Jesus. And so these covenants span throughout history, and we see these places in Scripture and how they're all connected. And in that same way, your lives are part of that arc. You have this large sweeping arc of redemptive history from the beginning, creation, to the end, and it's an eternal end when Jesus returns and reigns on his country and his world. And in there, we have a part, we, we ride that ark for part of the way. We are part of his people. So we have to understand that every detail is critical. And this is, this is kind of uh, 
what I want to get at here is to show you how you can start thinking about this a little bit. And so uh, uh, Aaron and I actually had the opportunity to preach out of the Passion Week, so that's why it's fresh in my mind down at seminary. And uh, actually the passage he, he pr- preached on, uh, it was about Jesus and Barabbas. And how many of you guys are f- loosely familiar with that story? Uh, he's like that really, or if you've seen the, the Passion of the Christ, the Mel Gibson movie, he's like that real dirty, nasty looking guy who's like, you know, when they're in a riot and a mob. And basically what happens is Jesus is wrongfully convicted. Pontius Pilate, the governor, knows he's wrongfully convicted, doesn't want the blood on his hands, and so he thinks, here's a, here's a loophole. What's customary is that we'll allow somebody to be pardoned. And so he's thinking this is going to be the out for Jesus. And he says, okay, here's Barabbas, and here's Jesus Christ. And you get a choice. Who do you want to die, essentially? And we know that story, and Jesus Jesus is the one they choose, and Barabbas gets away, and you're just frustrated. Like, what? That just seems crappy. Seems like a terrible thing. I get it, Jesus had to die, but this is just a terrible, terrible writing. You know, whoever wrote that, terrible. You know, how does it all, it just makes me angry. That's all it does. And when you start looking into that, and some of the modern translations have it, but Barabbas's first name is Jesus. Barabbas means son of the father. Well, who did Jesus claim to be? Jesus Christ, son of God, son of the father. And you see right there them standing next to each other in front of this riot. And all of a sudden, they're calling for it. And all of a sudden, it sets the scene for this bigger redemptive historical picture where you're like, I get it. This is foreshadowing. Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, was showing people what, what he had to do and what he was going to do and how it was going to redeem humanity in the same way that he stood next to Jesus Barabbas, took on all the guilt of murder and thievery and insurrection that he caused on, upon himself. And this was a foreshadow of what he was going to do on the cross. If you know those details, it gets, the, the Bible gets real big. Like, wow. But that's knowing that broader redemptive historical context. This is really important. So, uh, ultimately, I don't, I'm telling you a lot. I'm telling you what you need to look for, how it's important, but I'm not giving you anything. Like, great, Mitch, like you go to seminary. Uh, <laughs> this is where the rubber meets the road. You have to actually, one, want to desire to grow in this area. You want to have to, you want to, you need to want to desire to know the Father, to grow in relationship with the Father. That's first. But then you have to actually put in the effort to do this. And so I've given, uh, somebody can grab these actually. Uh, You can split them up. I'm going to take one. So I made a quick mock-up of some tools. You guys can see it. Bible study tools. All right. Aaron accused me of being a seminary nerd because I like bibliographies now. Um, I just literally, it's like, uh, this is not exhaustive. I threw this together in about an hour. Uh, But what this will do is start giving you some tools to answer those questions. And they have things from references. When I say references, I just mean these aren't read-through books. These are things that you go and like, what does this mean? And you open up to the section in Matthew and it tells you a little bit of history. Or Bible dictionaries, there's a word you're not sure of in English, and you're like, what does that mean? And you go to that spot in the dictionary, and it tells you all the potential meanings or the context of that. Uh, it has, you know, things in here like Old Testament theology. I talked talk, talk to you guys about a biblical theology, giving you the bigger covenant picture of why it's important. Uh, on the reliability. So it tells you about how we can know the scripture is accurate. Uh, systematic theology is If you guys don't know what a systematic theology is, it's basically a collection of any topic under the sun that you want to know about. So if you want to know about the Trinity, you go turn to Trinity, and it'll tell you everything about the Trinity. They're really handy if you just got some some big questions, uh, some church history stuff, some Old Testament, um, like actual history. Uh, Commentaries. Commentaries are just basically pastors, 
who have wrote all of their collective knowledge on a certain passage in Bible, in the Bible. I wrote a, a, one on there that I really uh, uh, affirm is Reformed Expository. They're really expensive, so you could check one out. Or uh, what I would advise if you don't have that is I put a couple links on there. There's some free online commentaries. A lot of those are like public domain ones, but still good ones, uh, like the Expositor's Commentary. Uh, and then I put in here the list of best commentaries by book. So there'll also be lots of just a commentary on Matthew, and you just buy it. It's a single edition. And there's a link here to tell you kind of their top ten for every book of the Bible. So that's what those things are. But I put on the back first step books on how to read the Bible. If you want, like, the 101, here's some good things just to jump into, to get your mind around it. This guy right here gave away some of these to our, our volunteers. Nice, pretty pictures. They say, like, key text, key term, one-sentence summary. Uh, things like that, author and date of writing, the purpose. Uh, it tells you certain, it shows you pictures of, like, things that they talk about, maps, the whole deal. Uh, it tells you how Christ is in that passage. This is really handy, and it's a reference. Again, you're just like, oh, I'm, I'm reading, uh, you know, I'm reading Nahum right now, a minor prophet. It's really weird. So I'm going to read from Nahum right here. Uh, so this is a really good thing. These are one of these beginner deals. Uh, this is uh, a great author. She's a professor at Gordon Conwell. And uh, she has these things. This is her book. But she has these sweet pullouts. Can you see this? This is actually the whole history of, which one's this one? This one is the New Testament. The whole history of the New Testament in a pamphlet. This is pretty handy. And so you can get these. I think they're like a couple bucks is all. And I have one for the Old Testament as well. She uses this acronym Casket Empty to show not only the history, but to show how it all leads to Jesus. Um, so there's just, there's some really cool stuff out there that is available. It's easy to read. Exegetical Fallacies by D.A. Carson. Uh, this is a book that just tells you kind of don't make the common mistakes people make when they're reading. I know Mackenzie has been uh, recently coming up against that where she'll read a passage that she's like loved for a long time. She's like, dang it, that's not what that means. Because she actually puts it into context and, you know, you can't just like make it whatever you want to make it. Um, that shouldn't deter you. That shouldn't freak you out. It's just, this is to give you resources. And then at the end is doctrinal books. This is a little bit more thorough reads, a little, you know, a little bit more academic if that's your cup of tea as well. So uh, here's the deal. You guys have verses that you're working on. I want you to start walking step two. I want you guys to start reading the front, reading the back, maybe read the whole book if it's not like a super huge book. If it's a super huge book, you might just want to find one of these resources and find the overview of the book and then figure out how it works. And start looking at what is the context? Who are the people? Ask the questions. When you read something and you're like, why is that in here? Why did they say his name? That's weird. Those are good clues to stop and to figure out what you need to know about that passage. It's not a mistake. Every detail is important. So that's what you guys are going to do this week. Next week, we're going to give you the next leg of this, the kind of part two of this little hermeneutics deal. And uh, hopefully by the end of this process, you'll feel like you've got a, a new understanding of this, this passage you chose. So again, this series, not a real, like, feel good, you know, Mitch, it changed my life. Uh, this is a teaching, uh, pretty simple, uh, not simple to do, but uh, simple uh, in words, I guess, at the very least. So that's, that's kind of what we're going to do tonight. You guys are going to grow in groups in just a few minutes here. And if you still don't have a group yet, come and talk to me, and we'll find you a group real quick. And uh, I think that's it. Your group leaders, when you find them, because they should have contacted you. When you find your group leaders, they'll tell you what room you're going in. Tonight, groups are going to be a little bit shorter just because the long worship band deal, and we loved it and grateful for it. Uh, so you guys are going to just kind of get to know each other and uh, uh, I think half off apps tonight, right? Oh, half off apps. So if you guys are down for that, let me pray. God, we thank you for the inspiration of your word. We just thank you that you make yourself available, that we can know just a multitude of things about you. We can know you intimately. We can know you deeply. For many of us who don't feel like we have that knowledge maybe of our earthly father, 
you give us that opportunity to have the knowledge of our Heavenly Father. God, I just pray that you would give everybody here not just the discipline, because discipline's important, and sometimes discipline doesn't feel good, but it's a good thing to do. But God, I pray that you give them the real desire and excitement to dive into your word, and that they would wake up excited to learn more about who you are, and more about how you want them to follow you and live for you. God, I just pray that any anxieties or fears or worries about the word that this might have stirred, that you would absolve them, that they would talk to people that could help uh, point them in the right direction in terms of resources, or uh, that you would even just take away that fear and help them uh, really embrace and affirm uh, the truth of your scripture, God. Lord, again, we thank you for tonight. Thank you for everybody here and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.